Welcome to episode 10 of Andromeda, and this is a pretty important turn. It's looking like perhaps the first war is going to start up here in a bit, and the nations that are involved might not be what you were expecting. So Ermor has received a host of messages, and this one is pretty important. So Saramadia has sent Ermor a message negotiating borders. He's suggesting that Ermor takes the range of shadow and that Saramadia will get Bogotan, and this is the key part of this message. He says that if Ermor happens to be invading Bogotan at that turn, he's proposing buying the province because it is bordering a future forded province. Now pay close attention to this little bit of information right here that Sarmadi is saying that this Bogotan here is bordering a future forded province. But otherwise, you know, this is a peaceful message and he's trying to establish nice relations with Ermor. Now, let's check out the map real quick. Ermor is sending two armies into Saramadia's territory. This is Bogotan. This is the province that Saramadia was talking about potentially buying if Ermor moved on to it. And he gave Ermor the information that this province is bordering a province that he's building a fort on. Now, there's a couple of reasons that Ermor might be making this move. As you can see, he's been casting Astral Projection up into Helheim's territory. So I'm thinking that up to this point, Ermor was planning on a war with Helheim. In fact, I'm almost sure of it. However, in a single turn, he has decided to turn his attention to Saramadia. And I think the reason that this is happening is that Saramadia has released the information that he's building a fort on a province near Bogotan, and Ermor is getting a narrow window to invade Saramadia while this fort has not been constructed yet, which is going to make invasion of the territory easier. So even though this message was talking about peace and whatnot, I think Saramadia may have made a bit of a mistake in releasing this bit of information. And it looks like unless they can tone this down with the next couple of turns, that it is leading right to war. And we should know for sure next turn when it comes to Ermor's actions, whether this is going to escalate into full-blown war or not. So pretty exciting turn of events right here. It's gonna be a little hard to uh, cover the rest of Ermor's turn after something so exciting. Ermor has received a message from Russ consoling him about the wolf packs taking one of his territories, and he sent him a little astral pearl in an envelope. Uh, this is actually good Diplo in my opinion. You know, just everyone just, just pass someone a gem or two sometimes. Like, it's hard not to smile when someone hands you a gem. Even better, if you're a nation with a forge bonus, passing someone a magic item, you know, like an owl quill or something like that. Like, if you feel like you're in kind of a weak position and you want some friends, you know, this is not a bad thing to do. Like, it's not a big amount or anything, but this is more likely to make people want to work with you than to want to attack you. And it at least might make them feel bad if they attack you. And Atlantis has sent a message saying he's going to move troops through uh, this province right here to get to the Triton Sea, and that it's not war and that he's willing for a non-aggression pact. Now, it probably upset Ermor quite a bit to have Atlantis just stinking up this pond right here. So Atlantis, if you're watching this, I don't think Ermor is gonna be interested in non-aggression pact or anything like that in this situation. And I think what your right move is, is just to move in, no declaration, and then move into the Triton Sea. You don't, you don't, this is the kind of thing, like you are going to be pissing people off if you move into ponds like this. There's no real way around that. The exception being if maybe someone is really desperate for your assistance in a war and they make concessions, I say, hey, you could have this pond over here. Otherwise, I think it's you should just move in and take the pond without saying anything, without trying to do any Diplo, because more than likely, they're going to not want you to do it. And Armor did cast Astral Projection twice, checking out what's going on up in Helheim's territory. So I really do think that he was planning on invading Helheim, but what's going on down here may have changed that up. It's kind of crazy how just like a few lines of text here may have changed the entire game. And even though in this case it might be going against Saramadia, it does show the power of diplomacy and how absolutely massive just simple messages can be to other players as far as the game state goes. Uh, Ermor has found a magic site in Pantocrator's Bounty, just some fire gems, nothing to complain about, and has had two expansion battles. The Bogotan one was minor loss, and then we'll check out the one in the Range of Shadow, just because, you know, it is a decent amount of tribe, and <laughs> this expansion armor looks pretty cool. A lot of varied units, something you don't see too often in expansion parties, though this is getting kind of late into the game. This is one of the last expansions. And you saw a good, ex good demonstration of the attack rear orders with the Equites. 
and that could be really devastating against an enemy army. So he did lose a single Equite in this fight, but he still has enough that this is actually a fairly powerful invasion army. And he's actually splitting up this expansion party. You'll see that he has Latos moving with the Equites and the soldiers into Bogotan. And then he has Gwilame and Zanbarth moving just kind of this ragtag group back here to potentially start raiding this portion of Saramadia's territory. Now, I'm not sure why he's moving Ovidius this way. Maybe he meant to move it with Latos because this is the guy who's been blessing his Equites. So it might have been a misclick here. Or maybe he is just using it as smite support and figures that these Equites are going to be good enough on their own. Though I kind of doubt it. I'm kind of thinking that he would want to move this with this army. Several events, nothing too extreme, just a PD event and a couple of negative events for once. He had a hurricane hit his coastline in Ramir. Probably divine judgment for slaying that sectarian movement last turn. Guess that god was real. And more brigands. A lot of brigands have been popping up lately around the world. And he's completed both of the palisades that he started. He doesn't quite have the gold yet to start putting this one to work, but he's got big recruitment coming out of his capital and is beginning to recruit Augur elders. It looks like he's already moving one out to do some site searching, I presume. Those are very good site searching paths. And sorry for the dog people in the audience, but it looks like there's going to be a massacre in Mapito Cliffs next turn. But you know, these dogs weren't good boys. They tried to rule the people. We can't have that. So Saramadia has received a message from Helheim offering a non-aggression pact or a potential alliance in a war. And I imagine if this message came a turn later, it would be pretty well timed. He had an expansion battle in Dumna, the Wolf Tribe province that Russ weakened as he tried to take it. And Saramadia was successful, losing only a single Oriopada. And if you remember in Panch Crater's legacy, there's been a bunch of events of the forest growing and encroaching on people's crops and whatnot. And it looks like something is finally coming out of that chain of events. And the little D&D &D party has managed to drag a bunch of shit out of that magic forest, and now the PD has to deal with it. And let's go ahead and check out that battle. So here's what's coming out of the forest. Looks like someone's been casting crossbreeding or something. Got a big ol' Etten and a named Darkvine. So I guess this is what's commanding all of them, even though it's mindless. And then Saramadia's PD mixed with some Oreopadas that he happened to be moving through. And if you look closely, mixed in, you've got a group of ragtag adventurers. You've got Jadros, a level 2 fire mage. Ingvar, some kind of warrior build. Gaile, a nature 2 mage with the healer ability. That's actually pretty sweet. Lano, which is some kind of rogue. And then Tarbar, which is another fire 2 mage. And he's hoarding the loot they got in the first dungeon that they went down into. So pretty sweet. I imagine the presence of the Oreopadas is going to make this a pretty quick fight and everything gets mopped up extremely quickly, though he did lose an Oriopada and a Lancer in that fight. But it's very, very worth it because now he's got a Nature Mage, two Fire Mages, and a couple of decently useful commanders, particularly this one, which is an Assassin that can scale walls. That's actually a pretty good find. And it looks like Saramadia is handling hippies better than Helheim is, and they're just booting them out. And it looks like with the way that Saramadia is moving units, he's not expecting what's about to hit him at all. If he was, he would probably be moving these Oriopadas into this province, but he doesn't seem to expect Ermor to be a threat whatsoever at the current moment. However, he does have 21 PD here, and he is moving a decent amount of Oreopadas with his profit up here. So this is actually going to be a fairly even fight, and we'll see how it turns out. And Sarmadius almost got enchantment three that's going to provide a buff for his Oreopadas, and then he's going to hit Thaumaturgy 2, which means he's going to have access to Mind Burn. So depending on how things go, and if Ermor does decide to push this into war, he does stand a decent chance of standing up for himself, especially if he could get someone else involved. Helheim did just ask if he wanted some kind of alliance. So we'll see how things develop into the next turn. And Kalum has received a message from Helheim. Helheim's just talking about the big fat stack of troops that Atlantis had on his border and commenting on Rilia because, you know, calum has been concerned about the war and he's been asking people about them. And Helheim is asking if Calum wants a non-aggression pact or a potential alliance in war. Calum has also received a message from Russ requesting that Province 64 be under Russian control, though Calum did just land on it this turn, so we'll see how Calum responds. And Rilia is calmly talking about his situation and his plans with Calum, mentioning that he does have a non-aggression pact with Atlantis and that he's pursuing research goals before he goes to war with a land nation. And we'll go ahead and check out Caleb's fight in Illidar. If you remember last time he failed to take this province, but he's come back with even more units than last time. And there's also <laughs> less enemy units because of the current battle here. 
and he manages to cause a rout extremely quickly and only loses a single Spirehorn Warrior this time. But the moment he takes the province, he sees a bunch of naked people running around the woods. This disgusted a lot of people and caused them to lose their faith in God. And he's also got his Palisade and Lab up here, and it looks like he's going to start by recruiting Harab Seraphs, which he's also recruiting on his capital, and he's switching over to more heavy-duty units. Uh, these Iceclad have Ice Protection, which is going to make their protection increase when they're in cold provinces, based off of the cold scale, and they make decent defensive units with this nation. He's got another Palisades going up here as of this turn, and Fuifusa is still in the cave watching Lucky Star. And now for Helheim's turn. If you remember last turn that Atlantis was moving a fairly sizable army into Summer Bay, let's go ahead and check out that battle before we check out anything else. So a pretty large and intimidating army that does include his prophet. And remember, these things are pretty icky with magic weapons and two attacks. And then this is what Helheim has been able to bring to the table for this fight. Massive amount of PD. I think he pushed it up to 40 PD for this fight, but having any amount of PD does give him a Van Heers, which is actually really nice. When you have a Heavy Bless, I think this is one of the better PD commanders you get out of various nations. Could potentially kill some thugs by itself. And then he's brought in a hefty amount of Hell Hearings, and this is what I would be very displeased to see if I was Atlantis. And now, let us observe. So already, no shields, taking quite a bit of damage from projectiles. And then the Hell Herdings come in from the top and just start absolutely decimating Atlantean armies. Now these actually did almost make it to the rear and start hitting the commanders, but there just wasn't quite enough numbers to make a full envelopment around this way. And Atlantis lost the vast majority of their army without taking out any of Helheim's permanent units, just a bunch of PD. So pretty fortunate turn of events for Helheim, though it did cost him a lot of gold to get this result. He did have to dump a lot of PD onto this province, and he even dumped some onto his capital because he wasn't sure which direction they were going to move. And just for some icing on the cake, he did find two magic sites in the Kingdom of Dara, a deep crevasse, which gives him earth gems, and this is actually a really good one, a fountain of fire. That's a lot of fire gems per turn. This is a great magic site. And he did beat up the weebs, by the way, in Jeleni Agora. And he's had an extreme famine event in Ministra. There's a province that he took kind of out from underneath Saramadia's nose. Actually, a pretty big deal, too. Something like a seventh of the population just died. That's a pretty bad famine. He's also recruited a merman commander here, I presume to build a fort with sages in mind. But yeah, I imagine Helheim must be feeling pretty good after this fight right here. And Russ has received a message from Calum. Calum is continuing to talk about the water nations, trying to figure out what's going on in the pond. And Russ has had a single expansion battle in the swamp, which he probably would have gotten to a long time ago if he didn't have that bump with Atlantis. So, nothing too serious, nothing that a few bears can't handle. As you can see, it doesn't even look like we're going to be able to see any bears in this fight. And a couple of minor events, uh, expected drought in Valgoth, and a province defense event on his capital. That's really nice. And then someone found a bunch of water gems and a huge chunk of ice. Which is nice, as he doesn't have any water gem income as of this moment. And as of this turn, Russ's borders are completely sealed in. And I guess the question is, where does Russ go from here? He's keeping up his recruitment of skin shifters, that's a good thing. And really the only route I do see for him is, yes, to lean heavily into research to go around and do some site searching, build up mages, and try to tack himself into an early war that is advantageous to him. Unlike Ermor, he probably isn't going to be able to start a war by himself. He's probably going to have to ally, but fortunately, you know, people have been for the most part, fairly nice to each other. He's already established friendly relations with Rillia and things seem to be going good with Ermor. So the giants have gotten a hold of a few messages. Saramadia, in many words, has offered a non-aggression pact and a border proposition. The border lying basically here, which seems pretty much what it's gonna be like anyway. And Helheim has also offered a non-aggression pact to Hinnom. So Hinnom isn't really facing any aggression from any player in particular. Now Rillia is expressing interest in a couple of Coastal provinces, these two right here, though he will know by this turn that Hinnom has taken this one. And I'm imagining that the Hinnom player is not going to want to let Rillia have this one. He's had a couple of expansion battles against fairly standard indies, no losses, not enormously interesting, other than the fact that one of them is right here, pretty much sealing off this portion of the territory in favor of Hinnom. And he is finally moving expansion parties to take Flat Glades and the Caverns of Ganek. So once that's taken care of, all he's really going to have left is this throne right here, and his territory will be more or less secured. He's finished finished his fortress in Sonor and so far is just using it to pick up a commander, probably to move troops off of his capital where he can keep 
on with the Mage Recruitment, and in a couple of turns he will have a Palisades at Cloudcap Spires. And perhaps we may see him build a lab here the moment that our Halba is done side searching. So as of this turn, from here on out there's actually a different player playing Atlantis. The person that was playing Atlantis so far was Australian, and he was affected by the wildfires in a way that made him unable to continue taking his turns. So rather unfortunate, and you, know, you might be thinking like, oh yeah, sure. It was the wildfires, it wasn't this battle. As far as I can tell, he actually was not even able to connect to the game for this turn, so he might not have any idea that this fight turned out this way. And so now the person who's playing Atlantis is King Sebastian, also known as Goosejack. I believe that this is his second game, and it's his like first game that doesn't use ridiculous mods. So he is very new to Dominion's multiplayer. He is representing Lake Michigan in the United States, and he wanted me to show you this GIF as a part of his introduction. So so from here on out we may see very different behavior from Atlantis. All previous agreements may be rendered obsolete, and we will see what that means for Atlantis's neighbors. And Atlantis has received a message from Russ who's apologizing for taking back the province next to his... Uh, Russ, it's, you know, if I remember correctly, you're kind of new to Dominion's 5 multiplayer. Like, Atlantis was in the wrong entirely in this situation. Like, the bump was understandable, like it wasn't intentional by Atlantis, as far as I can tell. That was an accident, but once the PD went up, like, yeah, like, you know. Even without that PD dump, like, it's not something that you should have to, like, pay someone for to take back a province that's next to your own capital. Cap circles are sacred, and if someone's in your cap circle, usually that's a declaration of war. But Russ was nice enough to pass along two astral gems to Atlantis in exchange for the province. Or more sitting upstairs looking down the pond like, gee, Russ let you have two astral gems? And we all know what happened here from Helheim's turn, so no need to go for that. Though this isn't an enormous loss for Atlantis, honestly. Like, these are all, what, like something around 15, 1600 gold worth of units, which is something that he will more than make back in a couple of turns of income. These scales are extraordinary for income. So it's hard to imagine what the new Atlantis player was thinking when he came into this turn, immediately to some nasty-ass battle where he took a ton of losses, really is sitting over here on the other side of the pond probably has no idea what's going on but he has greeted everyone else in the game and we'll see what he has to say next turn it looks like he might be moving either this basalt queen or his prophet over to the throne to capture it still no sight searching though you gotta, you gotta get geth out there and get him looking for some pearls and shit and really his turn has mostly been diplo saramadia is saying that he thinks that he's not going to be able to coexist with hinnom in the long run because some of his magic is a direct threat to hinnom's later game strategies probably referring to melkarts here and he's mentioning his expansion issues with the cloud mages and whatnot, and the bump with Hinnom. And Helheim's message is responding to Rilia asking about some of the coastal provinces. He says that there's no way he's gonna let Rilia have 119, which is this province right here, is that, yeah, that is his sage province. And he's also mentioned that he's planning on building a fort on it. Now this is something that I would rather not mention in general, and especially to a water nation. I think what's going on down with Saramati is a good example with that, but water nations, if they just really wanted to troll you, they could potentially interact one of your forts as it's going up and that's really hard to retaliate against and also mentioning the sages is you know something i would want to mention like personally i think this message should have cut off right here just period instead of the comma but you know there's a lot of ways to do diplo i'm not saying this is wrong i'm just kind of giving my opinion on how much information is being given in this i just think it's a little more than necessary <laughs> and, and and how i'm straight up telling hey atlantis is about to jump on one of my provinces and they're going to lose a lot of troops so Helheim's very confident about those fights. So he's like, yeah, if you want to go to war with Atlantis, now's the time, wink wink. And because Atlantis is having a player change, that, you know, even a potentially better time. However, Rilia is not exactly prepared for war at the moment. Like, this is really a standing army. And this is what he's got on his capital. You know, like, yeah, the Mine Lords are really disgusting. But he is severely hurting when it comes to units. And it'll take him a while to... <laughs> you know, build up stuff here and on the uh, on the throne province where he's got like one of these coming out every turn or two. He had a lossless expansion into Dagor and we'll go ahead and check this out. This is him pinging the throne with a scout and just kind of see what's going on here. So this is a throne that's directly next to his capital. It's <laughs> it's kind of brilliant even in the uh, troop composition that's hanging out here. So the units aren't very powerful. These slave troopers aren't wearing any armor, though these trampling shambler thralls could be a bit of a hassle. There's a... <laughs> Kind of a lot of them. But uh, this is the big puppy right here, a uh, full blown mine lord, just like what really it can recruit off of their capital. Really powerful water and astral mage, tons of water and astral gems, and then enslaved mind on a stick. So this should be a bit of a hassle for really to deal with, but it shouldn't take 
too long for Rulia to build up enough forces to go ahead and take this throne province. And people are tired of swimming around in open sewage in the depths, and a bunch of them left. So it looks to me that this is the only coastal province that Rulia is going to be able to secure. And if Russ isn't willing to let Rulia build a fort here, then Rulia is going to have to resort to violent means to establish coastal recruitment. So that's been turn 11 of Andromeda. It's looking like we might have our first war beginning in the next episode. So definitely check it out. Should be coming out momentarily.